HIM's involvement in South Africa and Lesotho began with Peter and Hester Murray. He was a mechanical engineer and a businessman, but God called him to leave a successful career and come to Lesotho as a missionary. They first came to Lesotho in the winter of 1993 to help build a church in the town of Roma. And they spent the winter in a little tiny caravan uh, building a church there. And in spite of the hardships of the cold and no running water and no personal space and that sort of thing, God called them to come back to Lesotho full-time as missionaries. They led a, a handful of national pastors, including Reverend Sekani Peku, in a program of aggressive evangelism and church planting. A lot of those churches started out in people's homes, and the people of Lesotho didn't really trust that. They felt like it was kind of a fly-by-night church or something like that. But Brother Peter Murray really helped to establish the church by building church buildings. And we found over and over, once there was a, an established church building, people began to trust the church, and then the congregation grew. And that was the hallmark of Brother Peter Murray's ministry here in Lesotho. <laughs> We believe you are restoring Jim and Freddie Howard were HIM's next missionaries in the country of Lesotho. They only spent one term here, but they built on the years of experience that they had as missionaries in Ghana, and the work really progressed under their leadership. I think the most lasting result of the two years they spent here in Lesotho was to begin the transition of the work from a missionary-led work to being led by capable national pastors here in Lesotho. And once again, Brother Tsikani Peku figured strongly in that. The two of them trained uh, other national pastors, and the work really began to grow as an indigenous work. Also, their presence in Lesotho freed up the Marais to move to South Africa to begin church planting and evangelism on the farms there. The Marais befriended Johan and Hesse van der Merwe, who were farmers just across the border from Lesotho, but in South Africa. And they began pouring into their life and helping them to become missionaries also. For almost 25 years, the van der Merwe's have served faithfully with HIM. Their roles have changed through the years, but they have been a huge blessing to God's kingdom and a great encouragement to the missionary team here. I've been a farmer since I can remember in my heart. I, that's all I wanted to do and talk about, and that's what I wanted to do. I never thought I would be a missionary. That was not part of my plans, but God knew, yeah. We grew up in a Dutch Reformed church in South Africa where only the white people attended, but then in 1990, me and my wife, we really got saved at the mission convention. That same weekend, God kind of told me that I need to go back and what I got at that camp, I need to share with the Sutu people on the farm. At that stage, I was a dairy farmer. We had about 100 Sutu people, big and small, living on the farm. I came back and I, I didn't know, I. I I didn't know what to do. So I started inviting other missionaries from other mission organizations to come and have classes. And then in 1996, it was, I think, we met with brother Peter Murray and his wife Esther that stayed in Lesotho, Matuking at that stage. And we just became big friends. Spiritually, we just connected. And he gave us a lot of Bible studies, and since he was a missionary with the Basutu people in Lesotho, we, we just knew that we can work together, and he got interested in our work here. God just led us, without talking about it, we saw a little old school building that was deserted. 
and halfway broken down and we it's on my farm and we decided to, to fix it and to start having services on Sundays for the Basutu people. That ministry grew from, from very small, just working with the people here. People started inviting us, farmers inviting us, different farms. And we just saw a need all around us that the Basutu people really had no evangelistic church where they could attend. And they were, they were spiritually hungry. They, we had youth services, Bible studies with the children once a week and services on Sundays and Bible studies. Abel's God just put on my heart to work there. And there was basically nothing. When we went there the first time, it was on a Saturday to invite people for a service on a Sunday. People just came and we had services on Sundays and Bible studies on Wednesdays. We, we experienced a lot of resistance, but uh, God started working and the people got saved and it, it just grew from there. Yeah. Before I went to our house, uh, we had services on a, on a farm closer to our house, between me and our house. The problem on the farms, if the people want to go to the church on Sunday, there's no transport. So with our pickups and I, at one stage, I used my old uh, six ton Ford truck, farm truck, and we filled it to capacity, taking people to the, to the churches on Sunday picking them up on the farm, take them to the service, have the service, and then after service, take them back again. So it was it was full day work. A Sunday was from early in the morning till late afternoon. But God helped us and people got saved. And so eventually we got in Tate Tanki Soklas, who's working with us now. He was a young man that came to church one day. I can't remember the year. But he um, said he came to church just to see the goals because at the church there were nice goals. And then he got saved and uh, God really did a big work in his heart and he's, he's, he's basically he's the leader now on the farms here. Yeah. I can just give you a little bit of a testimony that the original people that stayed on the farm when, when I got saved I, I started training them, giving them the gospel, reading every morning out of the Bible and explaining the Bible the way I understood it. I remember one morning there in the shed, I didn't know what to say about what I read. I can't remember the scripture and God in my heart told me, open your mouth. And I opened my mouth and the words just came out and God helped me to explain the Bible. So it, it helped me to grow spiritually, God did miracles and, uh, in my life. And I think in the first, that first seven years, he worked more in my heart than in the Basutu people's hearts that I wanted to get evangelized. Brother Johan did a tremendous job of establishing HIM's churches in South Africa and then gracefully handing leadership over to nationals. Reverend Tangiso is a wonderful shepherd, and he's doing an excellent job of leading a small team of pastors who are pastoring four churches in South Africa. There's two things that really excite me about what's happening in South Africa. First of all, it's church growth. People are getting saved and becoming disciples of Christ. But then the second thing that I love that's happening there is they're integrating men and women into the ministry as lay pastors to build the kingdom and multiply their efforts there. The relationship between Brother Johan and Pastor Tankiso is a beautiful illustration of the key to church growth, of training national leaders and then handing the leadership over to them. And that's been happening through the history of the work in Lesotho also. I think back to Brother Tsikani Peku. He passed away several years ago, but the strength of his ministry was to be able to see the talents of young people and then find a way to plug them into leadership in the church. I remember over and over hearing him challenge young pastors 
Don't be like a wheelbarrow that only works when somebody pushes it. Take initiative and build God's kingdom. He also believed in systematic ministry training, and together we started a weekend Bible school to train pastors, it was on the job training, and so whatever they learned on Friday night and Saturday, they went back to their churches on Sunday and put it into practice. Reverend Kadi Tabi was one of the pastors that attended that Bible school, and Pastor Tsikani mentored him and helped him, and today he's HIM's national leader in Lesotho. Ntati Kadi, can you tell us a little bit how you got started in ministry? In 1998, uh, my pastor gave me a Bible, and he asked me to read it on a daily basis so that I can help the people of Matuking. I arrived at Matuking on March 1998. The, the community of Matuking was reluctant to accept uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I tried to visit house to house and pitch a tent here, and this village, it was very, very, very uh, hard to go out. And I was read the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 59, and when I was reading, he says, the hand of the Lord is not too short to save, mm -hmm. but our nukes separated us from God. And on that time, I look my personal life, and uh, I saw, oh, there is a something wrong in my life. And uh, I was humble myself and confess uh, my sin. And after that, I was seen the numbers, numbers of uh, people come to the church. After I confess my my sins to to the Lord. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you see God working in the churches here in Lesotho now? What I can see, the Holy Spirit is working among the people so the people they come and they don't just come to the church but they come and confess the church is growing now so most of our churches uh, we had a visitors every sunday we see a new faces uh, every our churches yeah. Reverend Kadi Tabi has pastored here at Matu King for more than 25 years. It was a hard village in those early days. There was ancestor worship and traditional rituals and witchcraft and all those different things were going on in the village and people didn't want to leave that to become disciples of Christ. The church started in a small meeting room at the clinic with just a handful of people. I can remember some Sundays when we were first missionaries here where it was Pastor Kadi and, and my wife and I were the only people that came to church. But God has been working through the years and little by little His Holy Spirit has softened hard hearts and people are getting saved, the church is growing. As that growth happened, we outgrew that little meeting room, but God laid it on Wes Peterson's heart to build a tabernacle for the church here. And we're so happy about that building. Just this past weekend, we had a combined service of the four congregations that are around the plateau here where we live, and there were almost 200 people in attendance on Sunday morning. Besides the four churches that are near to where we live, there are three other congregations that are in the edge of the mountains. Reverend Pito Tais is the leader of those churches, and God is also working in those churches and helping them. We're seeing growth there too. When Peter and Hester Murray pulled their camper into the town of Roma to build that church, I wonder if they could have envisioned everything that's happened in the years since then. Probably not, but God often works that way, starting with small vision, and as we obey and follow Him, He does amazing things. Men got saved in tent meetings, and then they were discipled and trained, and they became pastors, and they too were faithful. 
and did the work of God, not like a wheelbarrow that had to be pushed, but with, with zeal and working hard. And now God has done great things here in Lesotho. There's a clinic, there's orphan ministry and ministry to vulnerable children. There's counseling services, so many different things that are happening that we would have never seen years ago. But God is building his kingdom and we're excited to be a part of that. All of this ministry flows from a healthy foundation of strong national churches led by godly national pastors. As Jesus tarries, I'm looking forward to what God is going to do through the coming decades to build his kingdom here in Africa.